I'm going to be recording. Awesome. So just to quickly kind of get started, um, we have a couple announcements um, uh, for some upcoming events. Uh, the first one is the Hyperledger Global Forum that will take place between June 8th and June 10th. Um, there's quite a lineup of um, various speakers, um, panels, so I highly encourage you guys to take a look. Um, here's the link to that and you can register. Um, this will be a virtual event because of the pandemic, so feel free to join um, and call in from wherever you may be across the globe. Uh, the second thing is the Hyperledger Social Impact SIG blog post. Um, so this was released um, in, back in March. Uh, we're actually, um, this is going to be the first part of a four-part series on the barriers to the circular economy. Um, at this point, we're really looking forward to any comments, um, suggestions for the next release, um, as well as interest from the overall community. So if you guys are interested in um, publishing a blog post um, as it pertains to social impact, please feel free to reach out to us via our, our mailing list, and we'd be happy to, uh, to look into those opportunities. Another thing is the Hyperledger Social Impact new LinkedIn page. So we are officially a LinkedIn company page. Um, so please add us on, uh, on LinkedIn and follow us. And um, if you have any announcements that you would like to make, um, any you know, different activities that are going on in this community, please do let us know so that we can highlight those um, via LinkedIn. Uh, the final thing is the Hyperledger mentorship program. Um, so the, the mentorship program has been kicked off. There's quite a list of 2021 projects across the board for the various Hyperledger products, as well as different use case developments. Um, so if you have you know, any recommendations um, or know of any folks that might be interested in participating, um, these are paid opportunities. Um, so for, especially for students that are looking for summer internships, the application for this closes May 7th, so please um, keep that in mind and feel free to pass along this information to students as that, might be, um, that might be interested in participating. So to kind of quickly get started, so we actually have a really exciting community presentation um, planned in store for today. Uh, so uh, Shawshank, uh, I, I see that you're, you're here on the um, link. So if you can, I'm gonna pass over the, um, the screen sharing. Uh, is it okay if, are you able to screen share? C can you see if you have the ability to do that on your end? Oh, I don't think we can hear you. No, sorry, my bad. Uh, no, I can't screen share right now. Okay, so let me stop my share and I'll make you a co-host and then hopefully that will resolve that issue. It's always positive. These are the, I think the, the, the rituals of the meetings are always nice. I think the meeting will go otherwise nicely. You know, <laughs> can you hear me? You're on mute. Can you share? It's part of the pandemic, I, right? And, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so then let me ask the next mandatory question. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Lovely. So uh, whenever you're, you're ready, Nancy, I'm happy to kick off. Yes. Feel free to start. Lovely. Uh, well, Nancy and everyone, thank you for, for having me and giving the opportunity to really share some of the work we are doing here, um, uh, which is what, what we call the UN Digital ID Project, um, and, and just walk through this. But please, let's try and keep it as interactive as possible. Do ask questions. Um, you know, I'll try and answer most of them to the best of my ability. Uh, I do have some people from my team also here. I can see Pablo is here and then, you know, it gets too deep technical then I'm sure Pablo will be able to handle it for me. Uh, right, so a uh, quick introduction about who we are. What's, what's United Nations International Computing Center? So uh, we were established uh, 50 years ago actually. And if you see my video feed, my background sort of says our, our golden jubilee is being celebrated by a, a resolution of the UN General Assembly, you know, that big tall building in New York. The idea and the intent then was to have a international computing center because three organizations, the World Health Organization, United Nations Development Program, and the main UN itself were looking to buy a mainframe to process payroll. So rather than sort of buying three mainframes because it was expensive, they bought one and they set up ICC to actually manage and run it. 
Uh, as part of UN, obviously, we are a not-for-profit entity. We officially, we are administratively hosted by the World Health Organization. So what, what that means is really I'm a WHO staff. Um, and uh, while from outside, UN might look like a single word, it is not. Within UN itself, we have a lot many agencies. You see some of the names here. These are the, some of the organizations we work with. Um, you know, from UNICEF, UNESCO, the, the ones that you may know of, UNHCR or the World Food Program, to might be some obscure ones like UNCTAD, UNCTAD or UNECE, et cetera. Uh, we do work with other international organizations as well, like the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, et cetera. So, uh, and sort of, yeah, let me just very quickly introduce myself. So I run what is called the uh, solution architecture section here at ICC. Uh, and I'm the chief technology officer and um, really blessed to have an amazing team to work with and, and, and try out some really cutting edge projects kind of work we are doing. Uh, by way of our association with Hyperledger, we are an associate member and, and the two sort of uh, highlighted pieces of technology that you see, we are already using it. They're actually in production deployment. And as I've walked through this digital ID uh, use case that we are implementing, uh, I will highlight a particular point where we do have a in-production system now using Hyperledger India and Aries uh, to be used in a specific uh, use case. Right, uh, so what is digital ID? And, and I do apologize to the, the group here if they already sort of know this, but generally depending upon the nature of the audience I'm interacting with, I find it quite useful to set the context. Uh, slightly philosophical, when we talk about identity, uh, I think we all will agree that identity is not just, you know, my my first name, my last name, or, or an email address. Identity is far more than that. Uh, it, it depends on my social status, my economic status. Uh, so the fact that I'm, 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 you know, married or and I have a family and I have a kid form a part of my identity. I have a certain ethnicity forms a part of my identity. So all those aspects that come and come together is what really make makes uh, my identity and for anyone across the world to really uh, agree to some of the facts that I'm claiming about myself, we generally have a third party between us, a trusted third party who would uh, attest these facts for me. So for example, I might get a birth certificate from a, a municipality or a borough or a state which you may trust and say, yes, okay, this birth certificate says your name is Shashank Rai, so we'll trust that as a fact. So we have a mutually trusted third party who is attesting certain facts about me, which then you can consume. And, uh, but it's not just one mutually trusted third party. There are multiple mutually trusted third parties uh, and they attest certain facts about me to make up my identity. So when we talk about identity, I think what, what at least I have seen as we were socializing this particular project across the UN itself was this misnomer that, you know, if you have an active directory account, that's my identity. I believe that's just a account. It's a set of username and password. Yes, over a period of time, given the challenges that these accounts had, we have added layers of security on top of it. And, and in a way, one can say biometric uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication uh, based on biometric might be uh, attesting to the fact that a set of username and passwords that I'm supplying are uniquely owned by me. But that still sort of just talks about one piece of information that is, hey, Shashank has this username and password because as a multi-factor authentication, he's biometrically uh, proved it. It does not bring with me all other attributes of my identity together. So when we talk about identity in the digital world, I think all of us know this very famous cartoon from uh, Peter Steiner, in the, which was published in the New Yorker, which primarily says that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So what does that mean for digital identity? For digital identity, what this means is a set of accredited social, physical or personal attributes that are digitally accessible by anybody who wants to consume them about me However, by my consent. So I am sort of playing a central role in saying who can consume certain attributes about Shashank and, uh, and, and yet trust them when I provide those attributes about myself. So this is what is the classical or, or the current 
model for identity on internet or digital identity, if one may call it so. Uh, again, I will not claim of having done made this diagram. Uh, there's a link over there. It's a very interesting um, uh, write up on the state of identity on the web today. But assuming I'm assuming most of us are familiar with what this is. This is really us as an end user who have a shared secret with an identity provider. Now this could be Microsoft, this could be Google, this could be Facebook, LinkedIn, or, or, or organizations. You know, For example, in my case, my username and password with UNICC. And then we have the relying parties who are trusting the fact that this identity provider has validated my credentials. Thus, when I'm accessing these relying parties, I am who I am claiming to be. And then I can obviously log into these systems, the relying party systems, and I can start feeding it any kind of information. So, you know, I can, I can create an account and then I can choose any date of birth I so wish on the relying party. So this is the, the current uh, state of OpenID Connect and, and how identity is proven on internet. Now, and, and the reason I call this slide the hammer and the nail is because when again, I was socializing this, this project across the UN, the, the idea was, okay, fine, we, we think decentralized identity is, is the hammer. Uh, so what is that nail we are trying to hit? What is that problem we are trying to solve? And, and thus, thus the title of the slide. So the, the, the shift in uh, identity and the concept behind decentralized identity is now really that we still have the three same players. There is an issuer and there is a holder of identity and then there is a verifier of identity. If you have to sort of think of this in the in the physical world, uh, and, and the reason I have sort of Her Majesty on on the on the left is because I have a driving license issued to me by um, uh, the the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles here in UK, and uh, if and when I'm stopped on the road by police, and I have to prove the fact that one I'm over the age of uh, 18, I'm eligible to drive. You know what my name is. Etc. I take out this piece of plastic, I hand it over to the policeman and he looks at it. He trusts that piece of plastic because of certain physical characteristics to sort of indicate that it has not been tampered with. It's not a fake uh, counterfeit copy and looks at the details that are there and accepts those details as facts uh, or he may also do a verification with some backend system and then sort of allows me to move on, etc. So, so that, that three-party trust system that we see in the physical world is what we are trying to now replicate in the digital world. So in the digital world, what we, we have the equivalent would be that uh, an issuer, which is what is called an identity provider in OIDC, has issued me a credential. And when I need to access some digital system, I'm actually going to the verifier and saying, hey, here is a set of credentials I have, uh, and I'm sure technically You'll, I'll be corrected the fact that actually it's the verifier who challenges me for the credentials and then my system responds back with appropriate uh, credentials. But I present the credentials to the verifier and because the verifier is trusting the issuer, they would take those credentials as empirically true and allow me or, or process the information that I have presented to them. So that broadly is, is the concept behind a decentralized identity uh, and from a technology point of view, uh, I'm assuming that since we are in the Hyperledger forum, people here are aware of the different roles that different technology components such as Indy and Aries and Ursa, et cetera, play in, the, in this whole uh, ecosystem of identity. But I'll get into some of the details later on after sort of talking about the use cases for us in UN. Yeah, some other terms uh, people might be familiar with, self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity, verifiable credentials, ZKPs. Uh, I believe fundamentally self-sovereign identity is a slight misnomer. I mean, whenever it was conceived, I think it has led to a lot of wrong perceptions. Uh, I'll be honest with you, when I started sort of looking into this, when a use case came up for ICC to build a solution using decentralized identity, and I started reading about it, my first impression when I read self-sovereign identity was, well, this seems to be, you know, long live the revolution, power to the people, and we don't need a state. Uh, I, obviously, as I went into the details of technology, I realized it's a different concept, uh, but I think that, that that still hangs quite a lot when the discussions around decentralized identity start about what self-sovereign identity means. Uh, and 
that is another reason you see the uh, sovereign head of a uh, uh, head of the state on the top left in the slide right uh, so what's UN digital identity and, and this is actually a YouTube video so if the slides are shared and if you can go you can also go on YouTube you can look it up it's called the UN digital ID solution uh, there are quite a few funny odd uh, videos that have been made out of it and, and just to clarify, no, we're not in UN, we're not trying to track everybody by injecting them with microchips and, and, and using 5G technology. But you might come across some of those videos that were built around the UN Digital ID video that we had released. Uh, okay, so what is that UN Digital Identity solution that we are trying to build within the UN ecosystem? And, and to set the context, uh, this is a slightly inward facing solution we are working now. Uh, in the sense it's meant for UN staff and consultants. So, you know, UN across the multiple agents, UN agencies that are out there on the globe, there are roughly about 200, 220,000 people who work for different UN agencies. And this is really trying to build a solution so that there is a lot more, and I'll talk about the use cases later on, interoperability between different UN agencies. So the problems that we're trying to solve, Today, within the UN ecosystem, uh, if you look at an agency like UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, they are responsible for uh, helping the refugees across the globe, or the World Food Program, uh, or uh, United Nations Development Program. Multiple of these agencies, they operate across the globe. Each of them are huge. They, these agencies are 10, 12,000 people strong. And there is very there's, there's hardly any interoperability of IT systems within these uh, agencies. The result of that is that, let us say there is a crisis happening somewhere in, in Central Africa and WFP has a bit of a presence there, but HCR needs to mobilize a workforce to let us say, set up refugee camps. The, the inter-UN processes are so complex that it might actually take HCR if it wants to use the WFP workforce, it might take HCR about two to three weeks before it is able to onboard some of those WFP staff and consultants and say, hey, can you go and work on behalf of HCR into the field? So, and that's one example where humanitarian aid gets stifled by just the processes that we are all slaves of. So, the idea, of, and that was one of the main use cases we are trying to tackle. And there are other use cases I'll go into details of which we are trying to solve with this digital ID project. The idea was fairly simple: is if we can have, yeah, if we can have a simple mobile app. The mobile app allows each UN staff and consultant to have a set of identities defined by the organization they work for, or other identities issued by other UN organizations in their mobile wallet. And as and when they need to be mobilized and these identities need to be consumed by different organizations, they can be you know, take, picked up from the wallet by user consent and the uh, organization can consume those details. Fairly straightforward, simple implementation of decentralized identity. Uh, so some of the use cases that we looked at and, and realized the sort of the value, uh, business value of such building such a solution, sort of the return on investment as I mentioned, onboarding the first one. So the estimation is that if we have to do interagency employee transfer, which uh, in the best case takes about five days, it can be cut short down to about four hours. Uh, pension eligibility, and that's one of our in-production use cases. Uh, I'll go into a bit more detail when the slide comes up, which historically used to take about two months has now been cut down to two, min two minutes now. And security clearance, and that's that's the MVP that we have built for, for this particular project. Uh, so typically when any of the UN staff have to travel in field, uh, there is a particular department of safety and security and we need to uh, take the clearance from them before we go into, uh, into the field. Especially if, if the UN staff is really tra traveling into um, uh, troubled areas. So if, for example, if, if somebody has to go on a mission to UN, um, uh, sorry, Yemen, uh, they would need the DSS clearance. And that is important because as UN, we want to ensure that, and especially the Department of Safety and, and Security wants to ensure that they know where each staff member is and in case required, in case of emergency, the required help can be provided. So obviously very important. And there are about 3 million such requests per year over here to 
to travel. And it's a very complex process for all of us because we have to go into the system, provide the itinerary details, uh, depending upon where you're traveling, provide medical information. Uh, and and uh, also uh, at times you, we travel to areas where there is no public transport available. So if, for example, in South Sudan, if you have to go from Juba, which is uh, the capital of South Sudan to uh, what is called deep field in UN, uh, a town called Bentu, there is one flight that World Food Program operates. There's a WFP flight, which flies once per week from Juba to Bentu. And imagine if uh, HCR staff has to not travel there, the amount of logistics and the administrative uh, overheads are, are really complicated. So th those are the kind of use cases we were looking to uh, uh, solve, those business problems we were looking to solve with this uh, solution we are building. Right. So different user stories, I have I sort of uh, spoken about a few of them. So rather than reading off the slide, I'll try and talk through some of these pieces. The idea that we can see was that the inception of uh, a person's identity within the UN really starts when they are about to join any UN organization for the first time. So it's really the organizational ERP, the HR system where the life starts. So how about we build a solution where when a user is being onboarded in a UN organization for the, there, they are issue, they, the systems start issuing a set of credentials to this user. The credentials are getting stored in user's uh, mobile wallet in their mobile app. The, the user experience is really that the HR person is onboarding the person. So let's say I'm joining UNHCR. I, uh, the UNHCR HR staff will know my personal email address. They will enter that into the system. It will trigger something where I'll receive an email to say, Shashank, why don't you go and download this UN Digital ID app and you know, uh, click on this link to receive a set of credentials from UNHCR. I would do that. My app would connect to the UNHCR system. So it will pull the credentials, which I'll store on my mobile app. And now that's a set of credentials that I have from HCR. Now I need to get some medical checkups done and I need some medical clearance and I go to WHO, the World Health Organization. And they typically today we carry this little yellow book uh, where we carry our vaccinations, especially for field missions. I, WHO issues me a new sort of credential saying Shashank is vaccinated against A, B, C, D, E. And I sort of store that information in my mobile wallet. So that's the general idea that with which we started building the system. Uh, uh, use it as I said, to travel overseas or deploy to a mission. Uh, mission, sorry, before you all start thinking of Tom, uh, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible, um, mission in UN context means when you have to travel for work. So business travel is a mission for us. Uh, nothing very fancy. And, and I can tell you, we don't go to very fancy places. So if you have to deploy on a mission, we can use this to exchange information. The example I gave, you know, so if I'm, I'm I'm working for UNHCR, but I want to take that flight from Juba to Bentu, which is operated by WFP. WFP obviously needs to know my details and needs to make sure that one, I have been cleared by the UNDSS systems to take that flight. I am really a UNHCR staff, and you know I am approved for the mission, the work that I'm going to do in Juba, or sorry, in Bentu. And today, as I said, the administrative paperwork is uh, quite overwhelming. But what if all that information was actually stored as credentials in my mobile app? So I could present that to the officer, WFP officer in Juba and say, here is all the information. He can scan it off another mobile app and allow me to board that flight uh, to, to Bentu. So those were the kind of use cases we were exploring uh, for digital ID. Uh, authentication, I think that's the no brainer part, which is rather than sort of using then your um, Active Directory accounts or local accounts, et cetera, really use the credentials stored in the uh, wallet to log into systems. Uh, and what this would allow is if I am working for, I'm working for agency A, and there is a system that I want to log into for agency B, I can actually use my wallet and the credentials stored in my wallet to log into agency B system. And agency B would know that, yes, this is Shashank because they trust the issuer of the credentials, which is agency A. Uh, which again is the is the is the magic that comes through the decentralized ID solution. Um, 
vaccination records because today, as I said, we carry this little yellow book from WHO, so we can store those records in, in the mobile wallet. Uh, this is an interesting one. Again, a big challenge for UN. So when we get deployed to field missions and I sort of walk up to an office and let's say Nairobi, so there's a big presence of United Nations in Nairobi. Uh, today, my uh, ID card, which has been issued by WHO, is not honored on the, uh, on the Nairobi gates. I will have to present either my national passport or the UN passport, the, the, uh, the blue booklet, to prove my identity to the guards who then would issue me a new card to let me enter into union office in Nairobi. And the use cases we are exploring is that if I can just use my mobile phone, scan a QR code, and then the, the gates or the guards know that, yes, this is Shashank because I have got my credentials stored in my wallet and allow me access into the building as opposed to uh, going through a whole approval process even as a UN staff. So again, a use case that we're exploring for physical access. Uh, this is the one which we already have in production and in, a, in an odd way actually was the, our, uh, the inception for ICC to start using the Hyperledger uh, uh, Indian Aries set of products. Uh, yeah, in a way, if you think of it, it's quite funny. We started with a retirement use case and we are working our, well, ourselves backwards. Uh, but the way this came about is that the, we have a United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund the fund uh, provides post-retirement services to roughly about 80,000 beneficiaries spread across the globe, about 198 countries. So the fund approached us about a couple of years back and they said, look, we have a problem. Uh, there was a new CIO and he was quite looking to bring in some, some changes into the, into the way uh, IT operates in the fund. So he approached uh, us uh, at ICC saying, I have a problem. We have a 70 year old process, which the business need is that they need to determine if a particular person is still alive or not. So whether they are the pension should be disembursed or not, uh, are they eligible for pension? And if they are alive, are they living at the address they promised to live at, at the time of retirement? Now the address or the location is important because uh, our UN pensions get adjusted to cost of living indexes of different countries. So if I say that I'm going to retire in Switzerland, uh, obviously, my pension might be a tad bit higher than somebody who says, let's say I'm going to retire in South of Spain. Um, contextually, just for people who are not from this geography, uh, South of Spain is, is, is a lot more economical and, well, personally, I would love to go there, you know, uh, beautiful beaches, etc. Uh, so, but the way they do this, this verification process, uh, which they have been doing for the last 70 years, is every year, they would send by post a form to the address with which the beneficiary was registered. And then they would sort of wait for the beneficiary to sign on the piece of paper and send it back. And that was the verification process for location and also the fact whether somebody is alive or not. And based on that, the pension would continue. Obviously they would try to, um, uh, you know, control it as much as possible. So if somebody is living, uh, for 120 years, that's a sort of an immediate red flag to say, well, looks like somebody else is signing the paper on the behalf you know, of this person. But within a, a, a reasonable range, it was difficult for them to determine what is working, what is not working. And it was also quite frustrating for the beneficiaries because the postal mail, you try and imagine postal services in around 198 countries. It may be fast and efficient somewhere, it might not be efficient in other places. Uh, you know, so mail is quite unreliable. So there was risk at times when people would post the form back, yet it won't arrive and their pensions might stop because the fund sort of didn't get the signed form. So they were looking for a solution to solve the problem and what we did for them. And um, in the truest sense, really we did not need a, a decentralized, ID. well, we needed decentralized ID. We did not really need a blockchain or Hyperledger ID at the back end. Uh, we could have in theory done with uh, uh, immutable database because one of the requirements the fund had placed upon us was that any uh, digital solution system we build really needs to have immutable uh, records because this is a 70 year old process that's changing. The fund is quite sensitive. They're quite heavily audited and they really want any new system to have clear track of what is being done and thus they wanted an immutable database behind it. 
So the solution that we built for them is a mobile app, which the beneficiaries use in the field. Uh, what it does is it creates a biometric profile of their face. Uh, then they undergo an onboarding process with the pension fund call center using the mobile app. You know, so they scan and upload a government issued photo ID. They get on a call with the call center um, um, operator who looks at the government issued photo ID, looks at the video call that's going on and looks at the profile picture, the biometric profile picture they have taken and says, yeah, they're, it's the same person. And then this person at the uh, required time is prompted to open the mobile app. Again, the biometric uh, features are matched and they are expected to perform certain random actions such as you know, uh, smiling or, or closing and opening eyes, et cetera, just to ensure that their loved ones are not holding a photograph in front of the mobile phone and it's actually a live person we are dealing with. Obviously, we can track their location, and all this information is then packaged as a transaction and sent to the back end where it is recorded in, um, in Hyperledger ND. Uh, in this particular use case, the mobile wallets, the Aries wallets, are actually sitting in our data center. So they are what one would call cloud wallets, so sitting in our data center. Now, the reason I went into so much detail on this particular solution is, as I said, we started with this. This is now in production, so we've got a production instance of ND and Aries and whatnot, you have it since it's been, it's been about three months now, uh, the solution was launched. And from this, the idea of actually trying to extend that whole uh, indie AD solution across to a proper decentralized ID was born. And, and the bulk of the discussion I had earlier on or the speech I made was really based on this idea then, hey, let's take this now. We know how to operate indie. We know how to play with Aries. Let's move it forward. Let's try and build a UN digital ID and solve the problem. Right. Uh, what did we do for MVP very quickly and the tech and that's sort of the last two slides and then happy to take field the questions. What we have for the MVP to demonstrate the fact that how this all will work is we've got three, uh, uh, the, the, the ledger itself, ND, et cetera, nodes running in three different agencies, the World Food Program, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and ourselves. We have got our uh, line of business ERP HR systems, which interact with the middleware that we have built. And I'll go into more details of it in the next slide. What is that middleware? What is the intention here? And then it sort of interacts with the whole, and this is, I, I admit it's very, very abstract. This was meant for uh, HR directors and, and, and further senior management in different UN organizations. So I didn't want to go into too much detail of uh, ACAPI agents and, and wallets and, and uh, nodes and you know stewards, et cetera. But happy to go into those details in this uh, call here. Uh, so we've got, for them, it was just, hey, you've got a blockchain, you've got different nodes running, they're talking to each other. We've got the API layer, the ERPs are communicating with the API. Uh, we have a mobile wallet uh, in a mobile app. Uh, the user information at the time of onboarding is pumped from the ERP why the API, and then the issuing agents or the issuing wallets for different agencies would issue a credential to the, the user here. This is the journey as I described that the user receives an email, which is what our API layer does. It sends an email to the user and, and it's got a link, which is deep linking. So if they tap on it, it just opens up the app. The app then automatically connects to the issuing wallet here, pulls the, gets the credential, displays it to the user and the user accepts the credential. Then what we have is this, uh, I kept mentioning this DSS, the Department of Safety and, and Security System. Uh, what we have is the UN DSS script system, which has been modified to accept another identity provider. Uh, and let's say when this user tries to access this UN DSS script system, uh, what this UN DSS script system does is we have built another piece of uh, code, the open ID connect to a DID bridge. Um, and so for the DSS strip system, it's just looking at an identity provider, an open ID identity provider. The reason we did this bit and the reason we did this bit is again, just to ease the integration with existing systems. So we sort of made an explicit decision. We'll not talk native DID. I know there is an extension to open IDC protocol to actually allow it to communicate again with verifiable credentials. We explicitly made a decision not to go that route so that these integrations become easier. Again, because we're dealing with multiple UN entities, the smoother we can make the whole black magic for them. You know, it's just sort of, hey, just this simple change and you can use this, the better it is for adoption of the system. So 
this is what we decided to be the minimum viable product to really demonstrate the concept to within the UN ecosystem and the UN management. This has been built and completed now. And now we are really looking to start moving and enhancing the system with different use cases. So bring in some HR use cases, bring in some physical access security use cases and start building on top of this middle, uh, the block or the work we have done. Uh, the stack breakdown, uh, as I said, we have Indy with uh, the trustee stewards and the validator nodes running in different organizations. In terms of agent, we are using cloud, uh, sorry, Ekapai as the cloud agent. We today have the Ekapai as a mediator agent as well to talk to the mobile wallets. And that's because we were using the React Native framework, uh, um, actually working with MVCO on that one. Uh, I think I saw James is in the call here. Uh, so we're working with that, but then we all jointly made the decision to switch over to the new JavaScript framework, uh, the one which the, the, the group collectively said to use. So Pablo, who's from my team on the call here, he's, he's helping use that, consume that, and also to whatever extent possible, contribute back to the community. And obviously, once we switch over to this framework, we will not need the mediator agents. Our ID manager and OIDC bridge, the two pieces of work we have ex uh, explicitly done separately, they are available on our GitHub pages. Uh, the idea of the ID manager, which is a Django app, is really to decouple and allow the ERP integration. So today, it just takes us, it's just sort of single API endpoint, which consumes, uh, which takes in a bunch of attributes and splits them across into three different credentials, core credential, personal credential, and uh, duty credentials. Uh, our roadmap, the next set of features we are adding to it is a full schema lifecycle management, because the idea is that each of these agencies can then publish their own schema and start issuing credentials against those schemas. So they can then actually uh, retire existing schemas, update them, and, and or add new schemas as they so want. And also the whole credential lifecycle part to be introduced in the ID manager. So you can sort of revoke the credential. Uh, so if somebody leaves the organization, they are uh, the exit procedure takes place in the HR system. We don't want somebody coming in making changes on this end. All that does is automatically the HR system automatically triggers the right APIs and the credentials are revoked. So all those pieces would really be sitting at this uh, API level. And that's what we're calling the ID manager piece. The OIDC bridge is really, um, uh, the, as I mentioned, it is an identity provider. The intention is that it will ease integration with existing systems. And, and we're passing quite a, we're playing, doing some silly things actually as well. For example, in this DSS trip system, if this particular user is, uh, doesn't exist, they're trying to access this system for the first time, we are actually, the silly bit we are doing is we are basically passing some attributes, uh, claims in the JWT token, which then the system uses to create the account. But the system can implicitly trust the fact that it can take the attributes that are coming in in the JWT token and, and create a new user in itself is because it's actually trusting the whole uh, uh, token itself coming from the bridge and the, and the DID. Uh, and, and to acknowledge and shout out, this was really inspired by the work that was done by the government of British Columbia. They, they do have a page on GitHub. Uh, their implementation was in .NET. Uh, the team, uh, I have the pleasure of working. We are all mostly Python and React Native, et cetera, people. So we just said it's easier and faster for us to port it into Python and, and, and start using it. So that's the reason it is, it's, it's been done in Python. And yeah, that's pretty much it from my side, Nancy. So back to you and if people on the floor have questions. Thank you so much for this for the presentation. Um, I think it was extremely informative, but I, I believe that the community probably has a lot of questions for you. <laughs> so we'll open up the floor for, um, for, for folks that might have questions. I have one. Uh, this is Brian Billander. Uh, nice to see you, Shashank. Uh, thanks for presenting on this. This is this is fascinating. Um, what uh, it, what's the current state of rollout? Uh, uh, what do you expect to have in production this year with with how many how many users? So today, we've, as I said, Brian, we finished the MVP. So that's uh, broadly uh, three agencies. The one you saw on the screen connected. Uh, we so. The way I like to sort of say in UN, we like to form committees and we move at slightly glacial pace. 
So we are waiting to form two sets of committees, one HR committee and one uh, we have a working group on physical security. Uh, these two committees are being formed. The intention of these two committees is to then look and, and come up with what are the two or three or four major use cases they would like to see covered. And hopefully over the course of summer, once these committees have been formed, intention is to start rolling those use cases that they have identified by tail end of this year. Uh, we do anticipate uh, another, or at least two other UN agencies to join this. And again, though they're, they're quite large UN agencies. So in essence, we will have um, uh, five UN agencies, the current three and, sorry, the current four actually, because we are working with the UN Secretariat as well, plus the two new ones. And hopefully by end of this year, we are able to produce at least one or two HR use cases uh, and put it into production. Having said that, the, the pension fund, which was obviously didn't require multiple agency cooperation, that is already in production. So there we are running Indian Aries and whatnot, you have it. And that's already in production. I think last I checked, we've got roughly 6,000 beneficiaries who have downloaded and installed the app and have you know registered themselves through the app. So we've roughly got 6,000 uh, cloud wallets, if I put it this way, in the JSPF solution in production. Hopefully that answers the question, Brian. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it, it, uh, understandably organizations like yours move at a certain uh, pace. Uh, and I think we're all grateful for the consideration and care uh, that is put into such moves. Um, but uh, but that's that's actually really remarkable progress. That's, that's cool to hear. Um, and I, I was intrigued by seeing World Food Program there who've done a lot of other kind of blockchain related kind of payments projects and the like. You know, are they looking at this or are other UN agencies looking at this as a way to extend what you're doing for kind of internal, you know, employee and HR kinds of uses uh, out into programs out in the world, you know, uh, on the ground? Yeah, so again, as, 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 as we are sort of Hydra multi-headed beast, uh, there, yes, the one just acknowledged the WFP program, which was based on Ethereum for payments and has been quite successful actually. So uh, Human Haddad, who's been uh, one of the key persons behind that program is also broadly working with us on the digital ID uh, on this particular program from World Food, World Food Program site. Also, in terms of taking it down to substantive programs of UN, there are a number of discussions that are happening. One of the challenges that we always run into and the questions start arising, I think there are two or three different challenges. One obviously is the comfort factor with such complex technology. Uh, the second one is the last mile. Uh, obviously today, what we have been able to demonstrate as part of the technology feasibility or the MVP to the community at large is that with a smartphone, a lot of these things are possible. But when we really start talking about infield implementations, the first question that's asked is a lot of the persons of concerns that UN deals with may not have a smartphone. So that last mile is, is being a bit of a challenge and, and really, again, a, a little uh, open question to the whole community here, which is that if there are smart solutions on that, we would really love to show that working, that the last mile can be handled without smartphones so that it builds confidence in the people who run the programs to be able to sort of be open to adopting these uh, solutions. In fact, there's a lot of work going on in that uh, over on the, the vaccine credentials side. Um, there's a lot of it. There is a, uh, um, another sister organization, the Linux Foundation Public Health uh, recently hosted a summit covering uh, paper-based credentials uh, and how you might squeeze a VC, you know, issued by, uh, uh, you know, or, or tracked using Aries and in, in Indy, um, uh, at least at least one that can contain enough, uh, validate, enough metadata to track a vaccination status, uh, uh, encoding that into something can fit in a QR code and then can be printed. Um, and uh, there's some open questions about privacy when it comes to exchange and that sort of thing, um, because that's one code that you use everywhere and thus can become a, a tracking uh, device, you know, uh, potentially. But um, but certainly scaling down uh, to those who don't have such phones is, is really, um, uh, is a priority for folks on that side. And uh, so there's, uh, I'll try to drop a link from the outcome of that summit in the chat if I can find it within the hour. Um, I want to create room for other questions. <laughs> Otherwise, I could I could ask questions for the rest of the hour if you wanted. Um, but uh, 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 yeah, let me leave room for that for for others to ask a question right now. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, and 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 sort of uh, I I do sort of uh, 
collaborate a bit, uh, quite a lot actually with um, um, with ID Twenty Twenty team, who again are quite fo uh, focused on the substantive problems. And again, with Indicio, I know James and Ken have been working on the paper side of it. But yeah, and certainly if you can share the information, so we can then really take that uh, as a demonstrable model and show it to the substantive programs. Because I think that the what we need to build is the degree of confidence in them that this will really work out. Cool. Yeah, I, I dropped the link. Good. The link yes, that I found in the summary yes, report yes. Um, wasn't. I, I'm not sure this is something you can show to others yet because it's still kind of a work in progress figuring out how to do this for vaccination credentials. But um, uh, but but certainly there's there's lots of POCs um, uh, kind of showing that it's that it's possible. But um, you only get like 800 bytes to play with or something like that <laughs> uh, in a in a typical QR code. So it's really uh, I might even be wrong. It might be 800 bits or something. Um, it's super tiny. Um, but uh, uh, very cool to hear. Thank you so much for the engaging uh, question and conversation. Uh, any other questions for Shashank since we have him on the, on the call? <laughs> really appreciate your time. I, I I do have one more, um, uh, and uh, please, I, I, if anyone else does, I, I want to, you know, make create the space for others to ask. But um, you know, one of the challenges in this domain is right now there are plenty of startups offering commercial support for Indian Aries, um, uh, but uh, it hasn't yet been picked up by the major companies, the major IT companies. Um, although I think Accenture has started to do Indian Aries but related projects out there. But but by and large, you know, if one were to go look for you know headline commercial support from a from a micro Microsoft or an IBM or an Amazon, it's not quite there. How much of that is a barrier to adoption by organizations like the UN? So uh, I, I don't know, sort of call us uh, stupid, call us smart, call us too adventurous. So when, when we started the, the, the JSPF, the pension fund project, again, a lot of this was quite an in infancy and it was really a, a leap of faith. In fact, um, at that point in time, Aries did not even exist as a project. So we, within the pension fund and ourselves, we knew we are taking making a leap of faith. And this is where I like always like to say, standing on the shoulders of giants. So uh, the team that 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 I work with at ICC, I was quite confident that if we run into some sort of trouble, we'll be able to handle most of it ourselves or seek community support and 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 go along with it. Uh, so yeah, at, at that stage. Uh, the idea of having some sort of potential commercial support while I did ponder over it, I, I, I was sort of quite confident we'll be able to get over it. I Obviously, as we grow and as this gets more complex, uh, we would like to have some sort of that question and, and, and quote for some degree of commercial support. Uh, but this is this if it takes the shape that we are trying to give it, it is getting quite strategic for ICC. And then we'll start investing in, in our own people and building up that team to have that uh, cushion ourselves to be able to absorb uh, some of the support needs. Um, but yeah, I, I can I can see in in number of other places, especially if you are not a, because we are an IT shop eventually. You know, 600, 650 or techies playing with all sorts of technologies, so we can we can handle that. But I can I can see certainly somebody if, if it was a World Food Program doing it themselves or a or a UNHCR doing it themselves, they would have really looked to have strong substantive support available. And they do realize it's a big challenge because typically the procurement teams would go out and look at Dun and Bradstreet ratings and other ratings for different organizations. So it would not just even be the case of, you know, here's a startup of 10 people and they'll be able to support you. They would really look for institutionalized companies to make that support. So there I would see it would become a barrier. I think for us, I was quite comfortable that we will be able to manage it. So sort of took that leap of uh, faith. So far, it's it's all holding together. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I, I, we're certainly hoping to see more more top line um, commercial support. I think especially with some of the vaccine credential work, we're going to see um, uh, some of the other companies step into this space. I, I mean, IBM stepped into it with uh, Health Pass, although that's not Indian Aries based. It is using verifiable credentials kind of under the covers. So they're they're warming up to the technology for sure. Um, 
<clears throat> actually, have you seen the pandemic increase in interest in uh, at, at the UN layer in trying to address digital identity and do that and, and, and do that in a way that, uh, I mean, I know ID4D has been out there for a long time uh, uh, talking about the, the relevancy and there's SDG 16.9, uh, talking about the importance of providing, <clears throat> you know, document, documentation for, for, for every citizen on the planet. But do you think the vaccine question has raised um, the issue of privacy in this in the digital identity, um, or is that still kind of thought of as a, a very separate topic? So, I, yeah. yeah, if I may, Brian. So if you sort of take that UN beast and slightly dissect it, it becomes quite interesting. So, uh, as I said, internally focused uh, pieces uh, still a lot of hesitation, right? Then there is the normative side of it. So for example, WHO has a working group and I think concluding their work as well on the digital yellow pass. And that normative working group in WHO, which has small, big, multiple players trying to come up with a standard for this is one part. The smart but vaccination that, record group or something like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. I'll have to dig out the name. I sort of don't remember it from the top of my head. But then if you see the role of WHO per se, there is the secretariat role, you know, so the, the working group is formed and they just act as the secretariat, you know, in a way, the way Hyperledger Foundation, for example, is working, you know, you're sort of just supporting the community to come together. They are really just al allowing the community to come together and come to a standard. Uh, but what happens as, as I think we all are seeing, for example, in case of vaccination uh, uh, passports is at times, member states start running off on their own. So EU has announced that they would, within the next couple of months, have, have something rolled out. The IBM bit that you mentioned is, I think, with Germany, uh, which I guess then becomes the EU standard in a way. Uh, the Brits are talking about it. Uh, so I don't know what they will go with. Highly likely they just follow what EU would do. Uh, so those conversations then, and as, as that adoption occurs, I think that will then start influencing the standards as well. I think we've all seen that happen over years. Uh, but when we come to the operative agencies of UN, when we look, and what do I mean by operative agencies? When I look at a WFP or a UNHCR or a, or um, a, what other a UNFPA population fund, the the adoption and implementation in field will take time. And this is where I when I was sort of talking about, you know. The last mile problem and being able to demonstrate to the program owners in these different agencies that they can take it to, a, a, you know, a, a, a refugee camp in Myanmar or a refugee camp in in Syria or Yemen or somewhere, they they know the pain point, but we'll really need a break to be able to convince them, and then implement the solution. And it's not probably as conclusive as you wanted, Brian. I just sort of putting the dots out there to see what the picture is for you. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm asking you to speculate on a lot of things, so <laughs> uh, not not a problem at all. Um, uh, yeah, no, this is this is obviously a space a lot of us are dedicating a lot of time in. <laughs> um, uh, actually, are you familiar with a, a project in India called Divoc? D i v o c. It is <coughs> sorry a uh, uh, a project to provide uh, <coughs> verifiable credentials uh, for proof of vaccination. Uh, uh, as a complement to the <coughs> Aadhaar system, but to do it in a more decentralized way. Uh, I can pull up the link for that, but uh, as a, you know, in a country, obviously with a particular focus on the full spectrum of, of uh, uh, use cases, uh, it, uh, and, and uh, I, I don't want to call them a developing nation because I, I hate that, that term, because uh, India has been a, you know, an older civilization than most of the other countries in the world. Um, but uh, let me see if I can pull up the, the link to that, because it's a, fa a fascinating project. <laughs> and, and I think what I haven't gone into details of it, but just talking about India, I know they have um, they've recently been speaking about actually doing voting over blockchain as well. Again, don't know the details, what is the underlying platform, etc. But there was sort of something that came around and just sort of had a quick glance at it. Um, and honestly, speaking about India, I would love to see that Aadhaar card moved into decentralized identity. I think it's right not too much centralized in my humble opinion. Yeah, no, there's a, it's hard, it's hard to shift from a centralized worldview to a decentralized one. It's, it's kind of like expecting Facebook to suddenly wake up one day and decide to be a decentralized social network. Uh, it's, it's very hard when all of your metrics and incentives and uh, technology infrastructure is built around a centralized concept. That's why Divock is interesting because it 
and believe it bootstraps off your Aadhaar ID, but then issues you decentralized credentials that aren't you know, centrally stored. There is there is a central record of who those credentials have been issued to, but it's otherwise follows the the pattern of you know the holder having having all the power in that in that setting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, yeah, it's it's all really good to see. Sorry, I don't have any other questions. I know we're right at time, so um, I I appreciate this. Thank you everyone else for letting me hog all the Q and A time. I sincerely apologize for that. If anyone else had questions and didn't want to get them in, so I should just shut up and see if anyone else has any last questions. And Nancy as well. Go ahead and put the muzzle on me, Nancy. I'm sorry. No, I really appreciate uh, appreciate the questions, Brian. I think a lot of those were in line with some of the questions. I think the community would also be curious about. Um, uh, Shashank, would, would it be possible if I, you know, I could share your email address just in case folks on the call had some questions? Yes, by all means. That, that sounds great. Thank you so much. And I will definitely um, be releasing the recording once this is, um, this is done uh, and, and make sure that we all have the, the link for folks that were unable to join the call today. Lovely, Nancy. Thank you ever so much for everyone for some being patient listeners and, and, and allowing us to present the work. Thank you so much for leading the way for the innovative work so that we can actually highlight some of the great use cases. So really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, bye. Thank All right, thank you everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Shashank. <laughs>